that's a big one. Um, you know, it's definitely one that we needed. Um, you know, it's, it's a very tough. Um, how big would you have to think about this? Is it going to go off the same time? You know, it's a big one. Um, you know, it's definitely one that we needed. Um, you know, it's, it's a very tough team, even without BG. Um, you know, they're physical. Uh, they get after it, and they test you in certain ways. And I think um, in certain phases, we passed the test today. Uh, not just with the win, but just the way that we kind of carry ourselves throughout. Um, you know, some little drama and some ups and downs. Uh, it was definitely a good team win for us. I would the biggest thing you set up in the playoffs, especially the only way to get into the game, guys. Um, that's something you guys take into consideration going into these games, or not really worried about it at this point in time? I mean, every win counts. You know, every game is important at this point. Um, you know, that's what happens in the second half. After All-Star break, um, you know, every game is a critical game. And, um, you know, we know we're going to play these guys again in a week or so. So when you know, it gets the, down to tiebreakers and things like that, um, it's very important. Uh, so it's nothing we really discussed before, but I think we all understand and are mindful of, of the situation. In the last, what do you think about the teams you especially down the stretch to get those critical stops from the guys? Yeah, those stops, you know, uh, down the stretch were huge. You know, when we're at our best defensively, that's when things go our way offensively. So. Um, you know, it's always a point of emphasis for us, and, and you know, if we handle our business on that end, uh, we always give our chances, uh, to give ourselves a chance to win. How tough was it for you guys down the stretch? You start by maybe it didn't work well for you. Guys. Yeah, well, I mean, it's frustrating when you don't even get a, a shot at the basket. You know, you can at least get that, but you know, we didn't execute. Um, you know, I turned one over at a critical point. Um, we had a couple other ones. And, you know, when you're on the road and, you know, you're playing five against eight and, you know, you, you got you can't do that. You just can't do that. With the way that the standards set up, I mean, yep. obviously playoff stretches yeah. is here. Yeah. Um, is that in you guys' mind going into each and every game or really just for the I mean, the, uh, the way we're playing, we might not even make the playoffs, so I don't even think we're, we're, we're even thinking about the playoffs. We're just thinking about winning a quarter these days. So, you know, um, if we make the playoffs, that would be really good. Um, what do you think about some of the contributions from players like Turner? You yeah. Know, obviously, you need some production with BG. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought Vani played um, great today, and she's had spurts of that throughout the season. And, you know, today, you know, she showed what kind of dynamic player she is. And, you know, she kept us in there in a lot of stretches of the game. All right, lastly, I got a question kind of off the court yeah. a little bit. Um, so everyone's excited about the uh, video game news. The who? The video game news. Oh, yeah. You guys, did you guys know ahead of time, or was that? Kind of news no, I think it was. Uh, I think it was a surprise to everyone. Um, you know, maybe we can make some royalties and make some extra money. That'd be nicer. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Another wonderful week here on the Focus. So much has happened. Um, definitely enjoyed the first two interviews to kick tonight's show off. Uh, from one Miss Diana Taurasi and one Christy Tolliver. Um, Miss Tolliver is the one who hit a huge clutch step back jumper on the uh, left wing. Cardell captured that perfectly this week. It was right in front of him on a baseline that he was uh, perched at this week at that game. It was a great game. Um, a big win that they needed because they're in fourth place and they're trying to hold on to that spot. Um, everyone knows they're missing a couple big guns in Deladon and Taylor Hill. I'm um, still, you know, uh, you were in the coach's press conference. You want to share what you told me after the game about, you know, the team being a little bit of. Uh, banged up at this time of the season? I mean, he basically said, you know, they need rest. You know, after the game, you know, he said they don't, he, he really didn't want them to see the court, you know, until Wednesday, um, any court, you know, <laughs> don't just stay away from the gym, you know, cause, because of the injuries, not just the Deladon and Taylor Hill and Tasha, um, and even some of the players that played, they're banged up, you know, it's just been a physical season. Even that game was tested, you know, I might, it might have been different in the press row, but on the baseline, yeah, they was hitting each other. It was real physical. They was hitting the floor. Um, both teams kind of know what's at stake. It's that time of the year where every win counts, so they was playing very physical. So, you know, health is very important because if you limp in the playoffs, you know, it, it's not going to be good. You're mm -hmm. more than likely going to get taken out real quick. Mm -hmm. It's going to be over before it starts. Oh. Man, and it's tough for everybody right now. As you guys heard Diana talk about, I think she's being a little bit extra facetious with they might not make the playoffs, but it's not too far-fetched. A lot of teams are stacked up, you know, a couple games um, separate them at the most. Mm -hmm. um, so if that if Phoenix is taking it that seriously, best believe the teams behind Phoenix are taking it that seriously. Um, Washington sees Phoenix again, I believe, in a week or two. 
So that's that's gonna be another huge matchup, and I wish the NBA would this format yeah, because it's awesome. Mm-hmm. That literally every game after the All Star break, which it lacks in the NBA sometimes, usually when the season just begins to pipe up a little bit, everything matters right now. Like it, it, it's wonderful, but um, Miss is in a tough place. They definitely gutted out a, a, a hard earned win mm-hmm. this weekend, and anxious to see how they do this week. They gotta hold the fort down until mm-hmm. Lane gets back at the end of the season. Like you said, and um. And one thing I like to see, and you know, I saw Crystal Thomas. She was on some hero. She didn't score that much, but 16 boards, you know, five offensive. I mean, 30 minutes. You know, she fully took advantage of not having Griner there, and they needed every one of those possessions. Because the thing is, without Deladon, they didn't have Griner. It was even. So the fact that they pulled it out is going, you know, especially after you know the bad loss against San Antonio, when they had no business losing that game. You know, it kind of, you know help them get back on track a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, and no shade of San Antonio either. I think they, they won three or four last games right. or they're in the midst of a three-game win streak. Um, they're finding their role. They're finding their rhythm right now. But for the Miss, it's kind of been like that all season. Um, yeah. I can't wait till the mag comes out. <laughs> um, you asked me a question about the contenders, uh-huh. and I, I try my best to answer if they are, in fact, contenders. <laughs> so, we, yeah, we're going to plug the next issue of Finest Mag because we can do that here. Uh, yeah. um, we're going to keep talking about women's basketball, though. we got a great guest calling in, uh-huh. and um, I believe she's calling in right now. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take this call. Hey, what's going on, Lisa? Hey, what's up? Not much, not much. Had another exciting event this Saturday, Rice of Passage. Event I always look forward to coming to. Um, let's see. I mean, what motivated you to start the Rice of Passage to begin with? Uh, something I always wanted to ask you. Well, I started it, you know, the first one was in the uh, for, uh, in 2008, and it was really a way to kind of bring in just only like the five freshmen. Um, we started with the team. And it was a way to kind of profile the class, and, you know, kids from the DMV, and have the parents be able to sit down and get some information about the whole recruiting process, how to check with the guidance council, how to deal with the clubhouse, how to deal with college coaches, and things like that. And what happened since then, um, every year, it got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and when I started it again, after taking a hiatus, um, we started getting kids from the Mid Atlantic area. Right. And now this year, I mean, we had, you know, we had players from about seventeen states and the district. Wow. So it's no longer just a local, a local event. Oh man. And there, and one thing I always notice is, you know, even though the girls are young, that's on hand, they're talented. They're like you can already see what they can become down the line of high school and college. Um, can you name some of the alumni that have came through this since you started it in 08? Oh, well, probably our probably our most famous alum is uh, Lindsay Allen. She was a point guard for Notre Dame. Um, she was drafted by the Liberty. She was cut. Now she's back with the Liberty for the full season. Uh, she signed with Dynamo Russia. She was on the 17 and under uh, USA uh, basketball team that won the world championship. Lindsay also came back as a coach, you know, all the years that she was in um, – she was at Notre Dame. Obviously, we didn't have her this year. We also had Adrian Motley, who was drafted. And we've had, kind of by the numbers, we've had six players on USA Basketball. Mm-hmm. And actually, uh, and seven in FIBA, we had a, uh, Jackie Vargas from uh, New Jersey played on the Puerto Rican team this year. This year, we had four players, uh, Zia Cook, Celeste Taylor from New York, Samantha Brunell from Virginia and AZ Fudd, who all participated. And we had 10 of ten players that were invited out of the 35 for the USA trials this year through the rites of passage. So, I mean, it's not that, you know, you know it's, it, it's, it kind of works out because we really look for players that have demonstrated early on uh, some of the abilities, not just on the basketball court, but personality, the proper attitude uh, towards the game that, you know, are going to be successful. And this is just a way of kind of, you know, getting the next generation in and helping them prepare for what's coming down the line. So when they go to a big trial like USA Basketball, you know, they're not going to be the, the best player in the gym, um, but it helps prepare them for those type of, you know, uh, you know intense events. 
So basically, you're saying if the girls come to your event, they're on their way. Well, you, but you could be humble. I'll say, <laughs> all right, well, all right. <laughs> it, it's 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 a it's a chance for it's a chance for them to be a lot of these kids may be the best kid on their AAU team. They may be the, be the best team, you know, kid in their community. But when you step into a gym and you're amongst your peers, who are you going to be? You know, these, this is the peer group that you're going to be, you know, judged against. This is the peer group that you're going to be, you know, competing for college scholarships against. Um, it gives you a sense of where you stand. Right. Okay. You know and. For the for kids, the, for the girls that really want to push themselves to that next level, this is really kind of just a you know it's just another piece in their journey. Yeah, exactly. One thing I like about the rights of passage is it's a lot of emphasis on fundamental skill and IQ development. You know, like when a, one of the players get the drill wrong, they don't touch the line, they make an incorrect pass. Or, the coaches would stop the entire drill and tell them why they should have made another pass and why that pass would work. It, it just you know. It, it, like you said, it furthers develop them other than just rolling the balls out and playing. Um, do you feel that's something that's missing from the girls' game? Well, this year, you know, we, we changed it up, and I don't know if you got a chance to check out the classroom session that we had at lunchtime, but that was really to go and emphasize what was being taught. Uh, I had a terrific, terrific coaching staff of young ladies, women who are, you know, some of my former players. Right. Uh, Players from the players from the area who are really vested in keeping the game alive and growing the game. So they work really hard on coming up with drills based on the deficiencies that we were seeing. Right. So the the level of talent is better than ever yes, in terms of what girls can do. You know what these young ladies can do, the moves that they have, their abilities. But the problem is they play so many games. The actual coaching part of it. Mm -hmm kind of gets lost and a lot of times they may get into a practice and they're being told what to do but not explained why to do it so if your coach is yelling go under a screen go under a screen but they're never telling you the difference between when to go over a screen but when to go under a screen how to make an adjustment you're just doing it you know you're just following directions you're just parroting you're not actually thinking the game and the way that you know a lot of times when you go to a showcase it's just kind of like, you know you're right roll the ball out we're going to dribble around some cones and we've done drills, individual drills, but I thought it was important that we really enforce the team concept. Um, our first two, our first two rotations were defensive, you know. And I, you know, people told me they've never seen that in a camp wow. where you spend an hour working on defensive principles. And the amount of kids that had never seen the defensive shell drill was a little sh well, it wasn't shocking because <laughs> I because I, I, I watch them with their teams and I know they're not being taught, you know, the proper. The, the proper way and the worst thing you want to happen is when you get to college it's going to be a complete shock yeah, yeah. you know if you <laughs> if you've never never gone you know if you've never seen any of these drills if you don't know the terminology and you really don't understand it um in the classroom they were actually you know they kind of came out of their shells a little bit mm -hmm. and they had to go up to the board and they had to draw things out you know and they had to articulate back what they learned mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to get on the floor if you don't know what to do. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. especially in college, um, you know, five young ladies that caught my eye this weekend. You know, Kiyomi McMillan, who's been there before, one of the youngest, uh, the point guard uh, out of OSA Sharpshooters. I don't want to butcher this next young lady name. Zakaya Young, out of New York, Tiana Key, out of Carolina, Bianca Pendleton, who's from the area, going to the Bullet School, and Stephanie Galiza from Conrad School of Science, out in Delaware. Um, those are some of the girls that caught my eye. Uh, who were some that stood out to you? And, and the players I named, what makes them, why did you feel they were ready for your event? Well, before we get into that, I have to <laughs> I have to tell you, it's almost like when you throw a party. You know, when you throw a party, you never really get to have enjoy it and right. have fun. Now, this year, I had a terrific assistant in Taryn Carter who did a great job of running this game day logistics, and I was actually able to sit and take some notes like I normally do when I scout, right. but honestly, I just got the film from my video guy, okay. and I've got, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I've still got to, you know, get a focus on everybody. I mean, I did see some, you know, what I thought was some, you know, very talent, very, very talented young ladies. Um, honestly, it's hard to put a finger on 
the standouts because I don't want to say, oh, they're going to say, Miss Lisa, you didn't say my name or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I understand. But I can, I can tell you, I can tell you why, um, you know, outside of basketball, why those young ladies are special. I mean, I, you know, uh, Zakaya is a very, very special young lady. Um, she's a tremendous, a positive, uh, she has a tremendous positive attitude especially on social media, and it's really refreshing to see a young person who embraces who she is um, and isn't afraid to express herself, you know, and, and, be, and, and, you know, not follow the peer pressure, you know, to do, you know, like everybody else does on social media. And uh, she's also a DJ. Oh, that's oh. <laughs> something near and, <laughs> near and dear close to my heart. Um, in terms of Kiyomi, I mean, it, it is no secret to anybody now, I guess, nationally, um, who she is, what she does. Um, I call her, my nickname for her is the Unicorn, because she is a truly mythical, generational, once-in-a-lifetime type of kid. And, you know, of course, she's in the sixth grade. And I've always been, you know, very cautious of heaping praise on a player that young. But I've known her since she was in the second grade. And... This is tr- this her 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 talent and her work ethic are truly organic. There is th- th- this is who she is, you know. Um, just like some people were born with the ability to just you know sit down at the piano and be a musical genius, she's on that level. And you know, like I said, she has a long way to go before high school, but I don't see any of that, you know, tailing off. Um, but all of you know, I. You know, one of the criteria that I have, I mean, other than, you know, being able to play basketball, is we look at the entire person. And, you know, and that includes the family. And I don't know if you know this, but the parents were very well behaved. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they <laughs> I, actually got a comp- I actually got compliments from the staff at the Bowie City Gym. They were like, you know, there were no arguments. There was no fights. There was nobody. It was like, yeah. because that's, unfortunately, that's become the norm at a lot of youth sporting events, not just basketball. But, you know, I have eyes and ears everywhere. And I've had to eliminate a few people based on things that, that have been observed by myself and by others. Um, and unfortunately, you can't reach everybody. Right. But there's no, you know, I'm looking for young ladies who are positive role models in the community and that are going to carry, you know, because the rites of passage is now a badge of honor. You know, I've had several college coaches tell me that they look at, you know, when they look at a young player's resume, that's one of the things that they, you know, they like to see. And I wish I could make it bigger, and I wish I could invite more people, but I don't want to become, you know, like the Walmart type of basketball showcase where, you know, it's just massive amounts of kids that lose or something. You know, we're, I kind of say we, we are like the little boutique on the corner, you know, the funky little boutique. You know, that we're just a little bit different. Um, and that's just the way that I am, you know, personally. I don't want to, I don't want to fall into the mold, you know. Okay. Well, Lisa, we want to thank you so much for calling in. Um, truly appreciate it. And we're glad your event went wonderful this year. And uh, we wish you continued success going forward. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. No problem. You have appreciate a great day. Always appreciate your support. All thank right, you. See you. All right, everybody, so that concludes the first block of our show. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we got some wizard stuff for you. We told you guys on social media we got a couple of what we think are pretty good interviews. We're going to share it with you guys. Coming out of this break, you're watching The Focus. We'll be right back. Obviously a big day for you guys. Um, heard a lot about John's character. Um, how, why is character so important to you guys in the organization? Well, John's our leader, and if he's focused on team success, making others around him better, it sets such a good role model position for the franchise. And I've gotten to know John personally, and I know how deeply he cares about our community. I know how deeply committed he is to helping those who aren't as fortunate as he is. And uh, I've watched him grow up. I'm like a young man. I'm, I feel like a, a proud uncle. He's uh, really, he's really uh, developed into a, a beautiful human being. 
and he's obviously one of the most gifted players in the league. So it just has been a wonderful experience in the seven years since we drafted him. As you mentioned, you and John kind of tied together since since you bought the team. How great of an example is it for, for you as well, since he represents you and the organization? Um, well, I knew John had such high integrity, and we communicate often, and he just loves the city and the fans. And so when everyone was saying, um, look at what's going on in the NBA and everyone wants to leave, and they asked me, what did I think? I said, I believe that this isn't going to be an issue because John has deep held beliefs. And um, when he hit that shot game six and he was up screaming saying, this is my city, uh, you can't know John and know how deep felt that was and not believe that he wasn't going to commit and be here for a long time. Um, first, of all, just, um, first of all, just we've heard loyalty, family, themes today ringing throughout this entire thing. You said you were relaxed about the decision. How much did that play into it, those themes? Um, big. I mean, this is a lawyer organization, lawyer city to me, so that wasn't ever the problem. I would just sit back, like my agent and my management team just negotiate the contract and just get all the little things that we wanted, like trade kicker, uh, player option, all that. Those are the only things I was worried about. But other than that, I was totally fine and committed to being here. All right, what did Coach like Scott was talking about when he saw you as an opponent and now coaching you as a point guard in this league? Where do you think your next step is for you as a player, seeing that you got an offseason without rehab? Yeah, I got three. I still feel like I have two or three more levels I can reach. I haven't even reached. I can get better in posting up, spot up threes, floaters, all those type of things that I'm trying to add and just being more efficient. Not to take so many dribbles and I have to try to use all my energy so I can save it for the fourth quarter but still play at a high rate. Those are all the things I look at and just sit back and watch film. All right, last question with the NBA landscape changing so much. How comforting is it knowing that you guys are state? Oh, that's great. I mean, nobody will want to move from this city. It's amazing. Uh, I'm glad that we're going to end up having a practice facility where the girls' team going to be able to play at and amazing fans can come and see us, watch us open practice. And then you have to deal with all this because coming here and practice sometimes and trying to work out is kind of tough because the concerts going on, the arena football team now, hockey, you come and run into so many people. I want to be able to just go in the gym, work out, and be peacefully quiet. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm sorry about that noise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to see if y'all are awake. Like technology's technology, <laughs> man. But what is wonderful, we got a chance to go to John Wall's press conference last week. Um, and it hurt us. We've been sitting on both of those interviews since last Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> it, it hurt us so deeply not to share those with you immediately. But um, hopefully you guys thought it was worth the wait. Um, Cardell, you want to share your thoughts from the press conference? And I'll share mine. I, I, mean, I thought it was good, you know, the, 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 the direction they're trying to go. I think he addressed everything, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, game seven, you know, a lot of people was waiting to go there, he, you know, he owned it, which I was impressed with. A lot of guys would try to point fingers, you know, we didn't have a bench or I need a break here and there, but he owned it. He was just, um, you know, I could be better conditioned. He said he's working on that this all season. I don't know if people watching, you know, he got um, a series with Ball His Life highlighting this, you know, all season regimen. He's doing a lot. And, you know, one thing he said in that was last year he played at 2.30 even when he came back, which, you know, for a guard is, is heavy, you know. And now he said he's down about 2.05, 2.10. And it's clear you can see him more explosive. He's more, um, you know, he's explosive last year. But that just tells you how much of a great athlete he is where well, he still looked apart. But, you know, me and you talk even last year, I was just like, I kind of thought he would tap out early, honestly, because he human, man. You know, you didn't have an all season to prepare for that grind. And um, even on the minutes restriction, he still ain't had time to gradually get into the season. But once the season came, it was like full boy. He had to play 40 plus minutes for them to even have a chance to win so they could try to make the playoffs again. So, um, you know, which put a lot on his body. And, it, and, you know, once your body goes, it can't go. And one other thing he said was he wasn't passive when he was playing, when he didn't shoot the ball well. Um, he kept being aggressive, which means, he, you know, he got a lot of dog in him. And that's why I say for me, that game seven, I gave him a pass because he's not known for not showing up at big games. You know, but I could tell when your body tap out. You know, even it was a play where somebody was on a break in Boston, and, you know, you, he, you could see him time in the block it, and he only got up to the rim. Like, he didn't get above the rim. And I knew that's when I was like, yeah, he done. He don't have any legs. So just acknowledge it, acknowledgement about that. Agreeing with Scott Brooks about becoming a better defender consistently. You know, he agreed with that, you know. I mean, he made a joke saying sometimes he want to put Brooks in a headlock because Brooks <laughs> always demanded. But, 
you know, just him acknowledging his shortcomings is all part of leadership. And that trickles down to the team because if he's not making excuses for him, then you definitely got to be on point because he's the franchise player. And if you're not on point, you know, you, you know they might be looking to get rid of you. So it, it just falls in line. He's setting the tone early, and um, I love that. Yeah, um, that's one of the things, you know, when we were talking, like you said, we were talking last year about mm -hmm. him starting the year and people that sometimes not understanding that when you're rehabbing for a summer mm -hmm. versus prehabbing and working on your game, it's two totally different things. You look at last summer compared to this summer, that's why I felt the need to ask him about it because this summer you talk about the videos we're seeing. He looks lighter. He got a chance to literally work on his game. And we hear so many people around the league talk about summer is so important because that's when you work on your game. And if you have to use that time instead of working on your game for getting your body together, that puts you all the way behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. And I'm still shocked over here in that number 230. Well, last year we like, he had one heck of a year. And I'm just like, if you it had 230, oh my goodness, you take 25 off of that. It's like, gonna be like the young John Wall. And like that's what I'm saying. Like that that's that's scary to me. <laughs> because if you were two thirty last year, the only thing we that we knew going into last year was your knees fine both knees finally felt good enough where you can jump off either leg. Where the years before we heard that, you know, it's hard to play where you have to choose you're that type of instinctive athlete to choose which leg you have to jump off. <laughs> versus last year, you just leaving. You wanna get off the ground, you go, you get off the ground. Yeah. And, Basketball, um, go ahead. And I love the fact that he said he got another two to three levels to get to because just to get give an idea of everybody who I still feel like everybody around the league doesn't really get how special that kid is. Um, and I hope he gets a chance, you know, to stay here in D.C. and prove it. And I like the fact that he wants to be here in a league where everybody's going different places. He literally wants to be here and win here. He talked about retiring, talking about having another press conference, in, you know, four or five more years for the retirement deal, essentially. So, I mean... It was nothing but good vibes, but it was great to uh, hear him own it. That spoke volumes to me. You know, we talk a lot, but it was great to hear it and for everybody else to see it. So it was just great. I, I definitely enjoyed being there. And like you said, thinking, you know, which leg to jump off of basketball, the wrong sport to think. You think you already behind. You are, mm -hmm. They already done caught up, made the switch. The play not there no more, especially in the NBA. So now he's just going to hoop. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if you saw the clip. Like, last year they had a clip with Sheldon McClellan, you know, was yeah. giving the work. But now in the ball's <laughs> life, John, he, yeah, he, he, he locking them up. He, he talking trash. Like, you know, he he the young John was talking trash. It's like, you know, last year I had to let him get some confidence, you know, like stuff like that. But it's all in fun. But he, he you see he's trying to get McClellan better because McClellan definitely a dog. Like, he, he man, they don't know. He Isn't think it? he the baddest dude on the court right now. Like, last year he did. Like, seriously. You wonder what? Having those type of dudes come off a bench is a difference between a team being okay in a great team. And that's why I think like the Wizards mean. are betting on them. I think that's what the Wizards are kind of... The kids developing? Yeah, because that's in house. Mm -hmm. And then what if they give you the same impact that it's going out to get a free agent that costs you like 50, 60 million? You see what I'm saying? Same money and, with the back end. And they homegrown. So it's going to be, you know, sometimes that's what the Warriors did. You know, I mean, KD came. You mean that whole developing thing? It's yeah. crazy how that works. You yeah, yeah man. <laughs> and let, let them grow. And the oh, Wizards got a hell of a, you know, staff because look, you know, just look how they've been getting better. You know, Go Scott Brooks an animal. Yeah. Scott is. Brooks a dog. Look, there's a couple people getting paid a lot of money because somebody putting that development. And everybody know early. Coach Atkins, man. Coach Atkins been around since I was a kid. Everybody know him. He, he man, he's one of the best that ever did it. So as far as development players, so hey, man, it, you know the future's bright. They just got to stick together and just keep improving. You know, I'm looking forward to this next season for real. All right, so moving on to DC United. Um, I told you guys been going through a rough season last mm -hmm. this past Saturday. Got to give them a lot of credit. They showed a lot of heart. It was a lot of pride on the line. They played the top team in the East in Toronto FC. They drew 1-1. It was, I kind of felt bad for them to step out of the objective reporter <laughs> place. It hurt my heart a little bit for, they deserve to win that game for how much heart and pride and passion they played with because it's been lacking for nearly three weeks. And um, I love what Coach also said. You get over to the site and to YouTube, both our YouTubes to catch the John Wall clip and Leontis. And um, as for DC United, Ben Austin's uh, post-game comments, um, and some, some supporters aren't too happy with it, but essentially they're not built to play the way that he would like them to play. And I, I think it's something where eventually we'll get to see what he would like, like what he envisions, but you can't see him until you have the pieces. And, right, and what's evident in his transfer window as they've been adding people and moving people, they're trying to get those right pieces. And it looks like they, they're nowhere close to where they wanna be, but they're trying to get there. Um, just this week in the last 48 hours, we had, ben, uh, not Ben Olsen, I'm sorry, Bobby Boswell traded to Atlanta. That was literally yesterday. 
uh, for a 2019 third, uh, third round pick. We had Lamar Nagel sent back to Seattle for a 2018 fourth round pick. Um, then they signed Bruno Miranda, a forward slash midfielder, and then Zoltan Stiber, a midfield, uh, 28 year old midfielder. And these are the type of things where, at least for me personally, and I can speak to anybody else, but me personally, when you play the sport outside of this country, you see the sport a little bit differently. And I think when you get players like Luciano Costa, who's here, they don't have enough players on the roster currently that see the game the same way as him. And in basketball, there would be something where if you're playing with a Steve Nash or Chris Paul and the players around them don't see things the same way, there's going to be turnovers. Sometimes those great players can literally pass you into the right place but you still have to go through that growing pains of understanding this is what they see or keep running. Don't stop running when you cut. <coughs> you know, when you cut, keep mm-hmm. running. Expect the ball every time, even if you don't get it. So it's that type of thing. They'll get there. But um, it's definitely moves for that both helps now and for next year. Um, trying to get it a little bit younger. Um, another thing from uh, Stephen Golf for the Washington Post sources indicate that they're on the brink of signing defensive midfielder Russell Canoose. Um, I might be pronouncing his name wrong, but... He's, uh, from what I can tell, he's had some experience in the Bundesliga, Liga, which is great. Again, experience overseas never hurts in this league. It takes them to get, it takes some time to get used to the physicality here. But what I do know is from the neck up, they're usually three or four steps ahead. They just got to get used to physicality. And for DC United, that's not a bad place to be right now. Um, so going to keep tabs on them to see how they finish out this year from a prize standpoint. Um, like they're not mathematically knocked out of the playoffs yet, but you got you to gotta keep working and start getting some of these results. Um, we're getting ready to take a quick break. When we come back from the break, we're going to uh, do rapid fire. But before that, we'll hear from Sean Franklin, one of DC United's defenders, talking about uh, last game, what he thought of last game. But we're going to take a quick break. You're watching The Focus, and we'll see you after Sean finishes talking on the other side. Um, just for you guys, obviously a very unlucky goal to let in. Um, from a character uh, standpoint, what do you think you guys show tonight? Uh, I think we show a little bit of fight. Um, we show a little bit of pride tonight. Something that I think we've been lacking um, over the past few games. Um, it's not easy being down a man uh, for a whole second half and uh, for this group to, to fight like we did and, and to get a point out of it. Um, I think it's great uh, going forward for us. Um, it's unfortunate we, we gave up a goal like that after we we worked so hard. But um, you know, credit to, to our team for for shaking it out and. And uh, you know, just fighting at the end and making sure that we kept the point. At this point in the season, being through what you guys have been going through, how important is it? Do you feel like you can build off something like this, especially how connected you guys were defensively, and to get out of this game without anything anything worse happening? Yeah, definitely. Um, this was uh, from a defensive standpoint uh, better. I thought um, our pressing as a group was was good from the start, and that's what we're going to need going forward. Um, you know, this this point is huge for this team. We, we were on a six-game losing streak, so to, to be able to put a performance like that, being down a man against the best team in the league, um, there's a lot of positives to take from it. Um, you know, we, this is a big one for us, and uh, you know, we got to take this momentum into, into next weekend. All right, Coach was talking about how you guys are built, currently built, um, that you know the way you guys fight is a huge part. Your identity is huge. You mentioned it was lacking with you guys possibly adding some new players. Um, do you feel like it's going to be an issue you know, trying to get them to immediately lock in to you guys? Like Again, you play with a great sense of urgency tonight, kind of getting that, that message across to whoever the additions may be. Yeah, I think everyone knows what, uh, what kind of group we are here. Um, players that have been here and, and the signings that, that we have, you know, um, you know, every, we know what kind of where we are in the season. You know, it's it's time to go. There's there's no time to, to sit around and and, and BS and and not, and not take take nights off. Um, you know, we, we need everyone to be on board. We need everyone to work for each other in the fight and um, you know, play play with pride. You know, at, at this point we we don't have anything to lose. You know, um, everyone's against us, so why not go out there and prove we everyone wrong and just show up week after week with good performances. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, you're watching The Focus. That was DC United defender Sean Franklin talking about last, well, I guess Saturday's game. It's not that far away. We just keep saying last week like that. <laughs> uh, but they got a big win this weekend. Uh, the Mystics got a big win this weekend. So follow us along both at financemag.com. I'm on sports. Um, the Focus is going to be busy this weekend. Very, very, very busy. That being said, rapid fire, sir. What you got for us this week? All right. First question. Markel Folds, Sixers rookie. There you go. Number one pick said the Sixers will make the playoffs this season. Do you agree? Ladies first. 
Uh, it's so hard to agree but not agree and disagree all at the <laughs> same time. Because I definitely think they have a chance if, you know, if they all get it together. But I just think it's so early. Like, you know, he hasn't even played in his first NBA game yet. So, I mean, let's – Let's, let's take a step back. I get, you know, wanting to be positive and, you know, this whole what what they call themselves. Oh, God, I can't remember. Fids. Yeah, the feds, all, all, the whole <laughs> feds thing. You know, I get the, the hoopla behind that. I mean, I think you would think on paper that it would be a possibility, especially in the East with it being as weak as it is, even though it has been getting better. So we have to give them props for that. Um, but I, I'm torn. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't happen. If it happened, I probably would be a little surprised. So, hmm. I'm with it. I have no issue with it. Not one tiny bit at all. Um, this is essentially what they've been playing for and sending people true. out, right? So I guess we're past the whole process phase. Like this is <laughs> trust the process. Now the process is here. Um, so I'm not really mad at. Obviously, all this is barring health. So, you know, barring health, I have no issue with the statement. That's the only part of the statement I have an issue with is the health, and that, that's a legitimate concern with the team. But I have no issue with confidence from a bunch of kids in a, in, in a conference that we all – it's been the Cleveland Cavaliers Invitational. So <laughs> I have no issue with them having confidence. And we saw last year with just one of the special kids on the court, the games that that kid played, they were kind of annoying. You know, and obviously that we don't know what Ben is yet, but I'm cool with the confidence. I have no issue with it, man. I mean, I don't have a problem problem with the confidence. It's just, uh, like you said, it's not just him. He had Mark Hill that haven't played an NBA game. Ben hasn't either. Mm-hmm. And one thing you can't underestimate is chemistry. Yeah. Like, it looked good now, you know, pick up and stuff like that. But one thing I always mm-hmm. say, and you know this, wait till the scouting report catches up. <laughs> and that's when it gets real. But talent-wise, yeah, they had, I mean, the bottom of the East is wide open, five to eight. Mm-hmm. You know, I even put, you know, the Bucks maybe five. I give them the respect that they earn, but the – Let's say six to eight. It could be anybody. So that's why they have a chance. But they got to stay healthy. Yep. That's the main thing. And they got to get that chemistry right. You know, you know, Ben already saying, I want to play point guard. So, okay, so that means Mark Hill going to move off the ball, even though he can play on the ball. You know, in certain type of situations, what does that mean if he's playing point guard? With, you know, what if it's a big lineup they're facing with Mark Hill yeah. have to set? It's just a lot of little things that they have to see and iron out before the season get here. But sometimes young confidence is good because you're just so oblivious to what the pressure is. You're just hooping. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing that I yeah. kind of like and, about and it. Because it reminds it's like the 86 Rockets with Samson and Lajvon. You know, they beat the Lakers, and they, before you know it, they're like, oh, we're in the finals. And you know what I'm saying? They was like, oh, man, we can win this thing. And then Bird and them put them right back down to earth, like, <laughs> real quick, like, this is a different game. So then they that was it. So that's all I'm saying, just because. But, yeah, he, he should feel that way. Um Oh boy, the undefeated listed at 50 top black athletes of all time. And here's the top 10. Number 10, Jerry Rice. Number 9, Gabby Douglas. Number 8, Simone Biles. 7, Hank Aaron. 6, Serena Williams. 5, Jesse Owens. 4th, Willie Mays. 3rd, Muhammad Ali. 2nd, Jackie Robinson. Number 1, Michael Jordan. Do you agree? No, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud their effort for, and their intentions <laughs> for what they're trying to do. I do not agree with several people are placed on this list, and that's as close as the answer you're getting out of me, Cardio. That's it. Man, I want more details. Like, which ones? I mean, you are oh, I got which ones. I'm, going, I'm waiting on you. <laughs> um, I, I think the same. No, I think I applaud them for the effort. You know, it's to me, like, it's never going to be a good list ever. Any way you really do it, it's always going to be somebody that thinks somebody should be another number or shouldn't be on a list or shouldn't be here or their accomplishments isn't big enough um, yet in their career or you're comparing them to the old times and people that were playing back in another era. So I just feel like it's always going to be a toss-up. Um, I definitely think there are some questionable people on the list, um, especially to be top ten. So, yeah, I'm kind of – yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, I applaud the effort, like you said. Like, it's nice that you know somebody decided to put a list together. I mean, I got a lot right of there. I got a lot of issues. <laughs> um, everybody know Michael Jordan, my guy, as far as basketball, but he not number one. That's Ali. Ali literally gave up his his career, you know, prime of his career to make a difference. You know, going to po- you know posing to be a non war, and that was during the time where, man, we just started getting civil rights. You know, mm-hmm. like I mean, can we go? Can we go in the same bathroom? I gotta go down. You know, go in the back of the restaurant to get some water. Like, 
it, it, you know, some of these, you know, no disrespect to Gabby Douglas and Simone Biles, they, they too young to even be on this list. No disrespect. I understand that impact, you know, as far as the gymnasts and swimming and whatnot, but y'all, they too young to even have made an impact. They haven't, you know, their body work ain't even up there, you know, and they the head of people like Bill Russell and Kareem and Wilma Rudolph, Jim Brown. It's like Arthur Ashe, 38, Bill Russell, 36, Jim Brown, 30, Wilma Rudolph, 21. It's just, you know, some of these just just disrespectful. And, I, and it makes me think that some of these writers are kind of young, just fresh out of college. And the one thing a lot of people get caught up in these days is just the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why you hear the goat man throwing around so much. And it, when we was growing up, you ain't hear that till, man, the body of work was done. Then you could really evaluate, like, yeah, he is the best. Okay, you know, but you got to you gotta put in work, man. And not just on a field, court, whatever. Really in the community. And, um... Serena, I think, should be more. She's very outspoken. She's the most dominant tennis player, well, arguably, ever. Good. You know, I think she should be top five. You Not know, really six. She she's six, but she should be higher. You know, I think she could be higher. She's the top female, though? Yeah, yeah, she's the top female, okay. for sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that should be. You know, but, you know, like Jim Brown, like I said, Bill Russell, 36. He wasn't dominant. He's at 36. And he was literally on the front line. I need to see who the yeah, 35 yeah. is before him then. You know. <laughs> In between 35 and Dom 10. Y'all more close to the right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And off the edge, 38. I'm like, who? They were. All those athletes at that time where I spoke, it, you had to be. So it's just, you know, I don't know. We. We have to find their criteria. Like, what did they use as opposed to figuring out article. how they made this? It's an article. This, um, yeah. they, the criteria. I want to see who voted. Yeah. I want to see the age. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because it, it can't be people who have lived a little bit who understand. Um, That's a big factor of it. So. Um, Dolphin signed Jay Cutler to a one-year deal. Cutler said his wife talked him into returning. What does that say about Dolphins management that they would sign a retired player over other players like a right, cabinet? So- and this could be surprising for a lot of people. I know y'all think I'm about to go in. This is the one place with cap I don't have an issue with. This is literally the one place. Is it a t-shirt? No. No, 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 I don't care about the t-shirt. I don't even think it has anything to do. Because this was literally for the first time a football decision that made sense to me. It's August. Preseason games literally start this week. Cutler knows your offense forwards and backwards already. I think it's no more than that. Now, if, if Cutler didn't have history in this offense... I feel a different type of way. But this is the only reason I'm not ready to grab a pitchfork and everything like everybody else. This was the first time that to me for Adam Gase, it it literally felt like a football decision to me. I know people were going running around with the t-shirt and all that. It's literally like arguably dude knows the offense better than Ryan Tannehill does. You know what I'm saying? Like Adam Gase just got there last year. And, and that's the part for me is that preseason games start this week and I'm never gonna listen to anything Jay Cutler says. Yes, I'm not gonna judge you for the fact your boy hit you, asked you to come back, do him a, fa- a favor. The favor is giving you $10 million. Yeah, in a favor. <laughs> I'm, look, I'm not going to knock you for that, but from a football standpoint, if he didn't have experience in dude's system, I would I would look at how I look at Baltimore. The only reason I don't is because I actually do feel like for the first time with the cap thing, this was a football decision. Even though I don't like Jay Cutler, from a sports standpoint, you have to do what's best for your organization. If somebody already knows your offense, and it's literally just about him getting in football shape versus getting somebody who you have to learn. Like, I, I know Gates was in the line to be the Niners coach when they were trying to figure that out. And when Trent Baalke was there, they messed the whole thing up. So Gates, I think the contingency plan would have been capped for Gates because he had offense ready to go with him. But at this current time, this guy fits your offense as is. You don't have to change skill position players or anything like that. It's literally just that somebody's ready right now versus somebody you have to teach. And the preseason game starts this week. If it was like last week, I might feel different, but that's just me. Um, I, I I get that too. I mean, I've been kind of torn back and forth between this as well. Um, I think most people's issue is just the fact that it's Jake Cutler. You know, it's his 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 game and and what he's done in the past speaks for itself. Um, and I just think. I know a couple of Dolphin fans. I mean, of course, we're not in Miami, but I know a couple of Dolphin fans that are like, they're really into it. Like, you know, the Dolphins have been coming up a little bit lately. So I think part of the uproar is just the fact that it is Jay Cutler and he does have an issue with turning the ball over. He has issues like that. But I definitely agree as far as them saying that he was the perfect fit as far as he already knows the offense. Now, I just think that, you know, the organization themselves have to bank on the fact, are they going to go with somebody that knows the offense 
but are, as opposed to somebody that's quote unquote, in my opinion, a better football player. So it, it kind of comes down to it's, it's the lesser of the evils. Which one do you want to go with? Do you want to go with structure and you want to go with, um, you know, being able to run the plays and, like you said, not disrupting any other of the personnel as far as not making anybody else have to change anything to accommodate somebody that's coming in late. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel like it was a toss-up, you know. I heard that they had Tim Tebow on the list ahead of cap, though, so that was a kind of like. I would say there's a lot of speculation thrown around with everything with that. Yeah, but. I didn't see anything, like, confirmed about the Tebow stuff. I saw people saying it, Mm -hmm. and, like, somebody came out today saying that cap turned down a contract. There's a lot of BS getting thrown around. Yeah, but names, so yeah, but this, know. yeah, it's, but to me, this this sign is still BS. For one, he's not even motivated to play football, yeah. and to be a leader position, guys got to play for you. I don't care if you know the system or not. That's BS. There's a lot of guys that know the system, and the team will not get behind them because they're just not leadership material. And it's been proven about that with him. Court, like I mean, you know, they have a lot of talent that's already surrounded them. A lot of young talent. What makes you think they're going to get behind this guy? That's a good point. And this is the thing. I don't think they're going to get behind him. That's my point. I, I, so. I think it's literally about the coach. I'm, I'm I, excusing Jay. I, I mean, yeah, I but I, I feel I you, but I feel weird. you, but, you know, not to even give him a look. And, and um, it can't just be all about football. It got to be a lot of that other stuff that pays a part into it. Because if it's just about the football, how are you going to take a guy that's not even motivated to even play? There's a reason why he walked away in the first place over somebody that's ready to play and stuff like that. That matters. Motivation matters. And then when they season go to hell, if Colin is still uh, Colin still out there, I mean Kaepernick still out there, then hey man, let's give him a call or something like that. It's too late. And then they can be blaming him for the season like they did with the Forty Nine. Like this is the thing though. This is and this is the other side of this. Miami has to deal with that because it's the decision you made right now. That's what I mean. You know like, what I'm saying? Like I agree with what you're saying, but for Adam Gase, I'm not. For him, I do get it. I also know that the owner has no problem with Cap. Some of the t-shirt stuff does take effect. I'm just speaking for Adam Gase. I, I literally believe him when he says it was literally just about dude knowing his system. I, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt because he was also one of the guys that was willing to go out to San Francisco and try to be their head coach. He, he didn't say, no, I don't want to work with Cap. He was one of the few guys, like Kyle said, essentially, Cap wasn't going to have that job if he didn't decline. It was kind of like, I quit before I'm fired. You know what I'm saying? Because he wasn't going to fit Kyle's offense. Gase had he been hired was okay with Cap. That's the only reason I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. He was one of the few candidates that had a plan in place that was comfortable with him. So for him to take color, if he says it's literally for the system fit, but, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I hear you, but isn't that what great coaches do? You adapt I your system to nah, the you. personnel I, you I don't manage. think he's a great coach. That's why I think this decision made. I don't think he's a great but coach. But that's what I'm saying. That's what great coaches do. They adapt to what You're they right. have. So if he's the better football player and a better talent, why wouldn't you adapt? So what you hey, have hey, instead look, of getting the That's what? all I'm saying. No, no, look. But this is what I'm saying. I agree with you. And this is what this is what has to happen for Miami now. Every week that this dude resembles Jay Cutler outside of 2015 when you were good with Adam Gates, you got to answer for this this entire year. Who was good with Adam Gates? He was good with Adam Gates the last time he played with him. Six and nine? Now it's about for him. I, I'm not so obviously good, period. <laughs> oh, okay. No, you, you know what I'm saying? I'm not talking. Sure. No, 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 no. I'm not saying good isn't like for league average. It's about personally, like for him and his little okay. mediocre pedestrian career. <laughs> his little mediocre nah, bubble. No, because he's making a valid point. I'm not saying good, like league average good. Right, I got you. I don't right, think we, he's we'll, a better player than Cap. We won't get a couple more before we get off. Um, Greg Schiano, he's the <laughs> defensive line coach for Ohio State, said his D line is better than the unit he had in the NFL with the Bucks. Back is he the, tripping? And look, back to that great coaching thing, mm-hmm. it's not one. Don't want to hear anything he has to say. Hey, but is he tripping? Of course. Why not in NFL? I got to talk to him. Wilson already said my answer. <laughs> Every year they do this, though. Every like, year. Just, it's like it, they but just, you know what? He's literally poked and prodded at something about the NFL since he's been kicked out. Yeah, it's bitterness. I don't have time for Yeah, it's bitterness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's not a little. Aaron oh, Rodgers Aaron Rodgers says he record interviews with the media to avoid his comments being taken out of context. Is that a good idea? I mean, it ain't like other people don't do it in others, not in sports, but in other realms of media. You know, I don't have any issue with it because a lot of times you do say stuff that you don't mean or it is misconstrued in a different way. And with their type of job, you know, everything that they say is so magnified and it's always so looked at so heavily and everything. So he could possibly say something that he doesn't mean. So, I mean, I don't really have an issue with it. It's not like he's like editing it down to the point it's like change of this word and I'm going to say the word over if he's doing that that's crazy but I don't really have an issue with it 
it just is what it is. I mean, I think it's more of a reflection where media is right now. Yeah. Because um, like, did you see the thing today about the UCLA UCLA quarterback? Yeah. Um, I thought it was a really insightful interview. He's and being real. Th- Anybody play calling? Got, no. Exactly. No, that's but the only thing that got like the headline was what he said about Bama. But if you listen, he also said, if you change that part about his quote, the next part was, then it would significantly affect the the quality of, of play on the field. And it was more to his point of football and school don't really go together. But if you read the entire thing, that comment about Alabama can't be taken out of context. Instead, the first thing I saw was he's throwing shots at Alabama, like, chill out. You didn't even – he's really talking about the NCAA and the farce that that is, that that whole we scare, care about you as an athlete and as a scholar when they, they mix. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, 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 uh, they butt heads. Right. So read the whole article. Yeah, but my thing is – if you a media, you know, a person, whatever, if you don't have an agenda, you don't mind. You record all mm-hmm. you want. Like, I mean, I'm going to report what you said, exactly what you said, so it's not going to be a problem. So nope. that's for the people who, you know, want to take bits and pieces for shock value, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying, and then create a story off that. They might not like it, so that's on them. All right, last question. You um, got one more? Charles Oakley. Okay. Got plea deal, you know. Got to stay away from the Gardner for a year, and, you know, and return the charges of harassment <laughs> and all that stuff will be dropped. Uh, what does it just, I mean, what does it say about Dolan even more? I just think oh, it's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, what does it say about your team? <laughs> but first of all, it shows how dysfunctional we are. <laughs> That's number one, because we are very dysfunctional. Um, but I just think it's, it's, it's another thing that, you know, is being looked at with them. That's what I mean as far as dysfunction. Like every other – like we were talking out, out there, it was like every other day I feel like we're signing somebody that <laughs> don't nobody even know what's going on. It's like we we signing random people every five days. Not saying that they're not good players, but I'm just trying to figure out where they're going with this. Like what is our direction? So it's it always brings me back to like if the head ain't right, Ain't nothing else going to be right. He's out here talking about harassment charges, and this guy was sitting in his seat. you just mad. So I'm like, I just think it's ridiculous. I think it's so stupid. <laughs> so how you going to ban him from the place he used to play at? Like, he like he used to play there. Like, what do you mean? More like, you're supposed, to you be, you're supposed to be welcoming, welcoming him in. That's going to bring more people in. It's going to make you more money if you, you know. Like, come on. It's Charles Oakley. Look, that's why I'm not going to comment. That's you got that. It was your answer. We're your so dysfunctional. But, uh, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. We, we yes, truly dysfunctional. We truly appreciate it. <laughs> dysfunctional is going to be a thing here for us. <laughs> we thank y'all for tuning in. Get over to finestmag.com. Get over to mymodelsports.com. And always follow us here at The Focus. We'll see you guys next week, same time, same place. Appreciate you. <laughs>